There's a promise found in the book Desire of Ages, page 329, which I found very practical and encouraging. It's very short and very simple. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger will you become in his strength. If Peter had recognized his weakness, he would have been prepared to receive God's strength. You see, it's our own confidence in ourselves, our own ignorance of our own default condition that leads us, like Peter, to operate without the incredible divine power that deeper faith can bring. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Welcome to day six of our 10-day journey through the upper room. Today we're going to be looking at one of the most important tasks that took place in the disciples' experience as the church was being prepared for Pentecost. Let's join Pastor Mark Finley as he shares with us this important message on self-examination. During this series, 10 Days in the Upper Room, we're looking at the character qualities of the disciples and noticing how they spent 10 days opening their hearts to God, being renewed spiritually. Our topic in this presentation is titled Self-Examination. In this presentation, we're going to look deeply within our own souls and look there not simply to see all of our weaknesses and faults, but look there to be open and honest and transparent before God so that Christ can do the work in our hearts that He so desires. Jesus speaks to us through his word. And as he does, he says, let every man examine himself. And that's precisely what took place at Pentecost. At Pentecost, the time was right and the disciples were ready. You see, there are two things that really characterized at Pentecost the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. First, the time was right. Jesus had ascended to heaven. His sacrifice had been accepted by the Father and the time for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in early reign power, that his early reign is an expression that comes from ancient Israel where the rain falls at, in, to germinate the seed. The time was right. The seed planted by Jesus would be germinated in the first century in an, and it would grow to an abundant harvest on Pentecost when 3,000 were baptized in a day. Rain, water, is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. So that early rain, the water of the Spirit, would come to launch the Christian church. And the reason we're so interested in studying these 10 days in the upper room is because God's Word has promised at the end of time, latter rain, that is, the last outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place to finish the gospel work on earth. So we're interested in what happened in the upper room. The time was right. It was time to launch the Christian church with abundant power. But secondly, something else was taking place. The disciples had prepared their hearts. The disciples were opening their hearts to be ready for everything that God wanted to do through them. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 32, the Bible puts it this way. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul. In other words, those who believed were together. There was a unity and they were looking within to be sure that there were no barriers between them and anybody else. In Acts of the Apostles, page 37, it puts it this way. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for soul saving. Now notice, these were days of what? Deep heart preparation. But what was taking place in their hearts? What kind of preparation was occurring? In the book of Evangelism, page 698, Commenting on what was going on in the upper room, Ellen White says, After Christ's ascension, the disciples were gathered together in one place 
to make humble supplication to God, and after 10 days of heart searching and self-examination, the way was prepared for the Holy Spirit to enter the cleansed, consecrated soul temple. Now notice carefully, these were days of humiliation, these were days of heart searching, these were days of self-examination. So the disciples knelt before God and they prayed a prayer like this, Dear Lord, try me. Dear Lord, look into my heart. Dear Lord, see if there's any wicked way in me. Lord, I want nothing between me and you. I want nothing between me and anybody else. Lord, I long to have a heart that is cleansed for you. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the Bible puts it this way. It says, looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Did you notice the Bible talks about a root of bitterness? So there are roots, and the roots produce shoots, and the shoots produce fruits. Have you ever noticed that? You get this little root, it's underneath the soil, and at the right time it rains, and there's some sun out, and the root begins to produce this little green shoot, and if the shoot grows long enough, it produces a fruit. That happens in our own life. There may be a root of bitterness in our heart, and that root of bitterness in our heart under the right circumstances begins to grow and it produces a shoot of anger. And that shoot of anger produces the fruit of conflict or there may be a root in our heart of lust. And that root of lust begins to spring up and produce the shoot of immorality. And immoral thoughts grip us and that produces the fruit of adultery. There may be the shoot in our heart of dishonesty, and that produces the fruit of cheating, which leads to the fruit of beyond that shoot of cheating. It leads to a, to a fruit of a life of dishonesty. Roots produce shoots that produce character fruits, and that's why, Hebrews says, looking diligently within, examining your heart within, to see if there is any deep fruit there. My wife and I, on our honeymoon many, many years ago, visited the east coast of America, and we're up in Vermont, and we visited an old fort called Fort Ticonderoga. And in those days, as a young man, 21, 22 years old, I was interested in finding one of the Indian arrowheads. And so I said to our guide who was taking us around Fort Ticonderoga, I said, you know, I've heard that sometimes you find arrowheads here. Where do you find them? And he said, right by the front gate. And I said, what do you mean? Hundreds, thousands of tourists come through this front gate every day. How could there be any arrowheads left? Everybody's scouring for them. He said, in the springtime, after the thaw, arrowheads that are maybe a half an inch or an inch beneath the dirt are brought, sucked up to the surface. And many times we find them right here. What arrowhead is lurking beneath the surface of your heart? What spear is there to put a barb in another through words of criticism? What's deep in your heart? You see, that's why the psalmist puts it this way in Psalm 26, verse 2 and 3. Examine me, O Lord, improve me. Try my mind and my heart, for your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I've walked in your truth. This is it. David says, examine me, O God, because I want to walk in your truth. Are you on your knees asking God to examine your heart? What happens when we're on our knees asking God to examine our heart? Isaiah found himself on his knees, and when he saw the searchlight of God's love shine upon him, he cried out, Woe is me, for I am undone. Isaiah 6, verse 5. And often we do that. The closer we draw to Jesus, the more faulty we appear in our own eyes. The closer we draw to Jesus, the more we see our uncleanness. But as we are on our knees seeing that uncleanness, we cry out to God, and we say, oh, Jesus, forgive my sin. 
Oh, Jesus, clothe me with your beauty, your grace, your righteousness. As we examine our hearts and open our hearts to Him and give Him anything that lurks deep within, as we do that, His Holy Spirit floods into our lives with its cleansing power. Self-examination may not always be the most pleasant experience, but it's absolutely necessary. If you're going to grow in the Christian life and you simply live a blasé life, you simply live a complacent life and you say, well, I love Jesus and that's all, you'll never have the deep, intimate experience with God. The great Bible heroes of the past, the great stalwarts of faith, the great giants of spirituality were men and women who on their knees knelt down and asked God to examine their hearts and to totally change their lives. I love the way Christ's Object Lessons puts it. Christ's Object Lessons, page 194, says this, If the family, in the family, if one member is lost to God, every means should be used for his recovery. On the part of all the others, let there be diligent, careful self-examination. Let the life practice be investigated. See if there is not some mistake, some error in management by which that soul is confirmed in impenitence. In other words, if my wife doesn't know Jesus, if my husband doesn't know Jesus, if my child doesn't know Jesus, I want to ask myself, Lord, I'm claiming to be the Christian one here. But could it be that there may be something in my own life? Could it be that there's something inside of me that's causing a barrier between that person and you? Or do I come across arrogantly? At times, am I proud? Have I been harsh? Have I been judgmental? Have my words been quick and critical? Oh, Lord, if they have, forgive me. Lord, help me to examine my own heart. Help me examine my own life. If I'm trying to witness to my neighbor, if I'm trying to witness to a working colleague, is there anything about me that would turn off that working colleague to you? Lord, far be it from me, claiming to be a Christian, to turn somebody else off to Christianity because of my life. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24 puts it this way. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O God. Did you notice that passage? That's what self-examination is all about and that's what the disciples were doing in the upper room. They were on their knees. They were humbling their hearts. They were interceding for power. They were confessing their sins. They were coming together in unity. Before God makes us, God will break us. Before He makes us, He must do something else for us. He must break us. You see, before God can do anything through me, He must do something to me. Before God can do something with me, He must do something for me. Before God can use me to reach the world, He must reach me. Before I can speak for Him, He must speak to me. Before God ever takes me, and fills me with His Spirit to reach others with the gospel. That same Spirit works in my life to transform me. Understanding our sinfulness prepares us to receive His righteousness. God never leaves us in this state of self-examination where we are wallowing in our sins saying, oh God, I'm undone, oh God, I'm evil, oh God, I'm sinful, oh God, I'm wicked. That's the last thing in the world God wants 
to leave us with. We look deep within our hearts to see our weaknesses, but we don't remain there very often. The Bible says in Isaiah 45, verse 22, looking unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus and be saved all the ends of the earth, for there is none other. Salvation comes as we look to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1 says, Consider Jesus, the high priest and apostle of our faith. Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So we look to Jesus. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. Yes, we look within, we examine our hearts, but we don't stay there. We present to Him that which is in our life that's not in harmony with His will. But our focus is on Jesus, His forgiveness, His mercy, His love, His grace, His goodness, His righteousness. Looking to Jesus, we become whole. Looking to Jesus, our lives are transformed. Looking to Jesus, we are made new. Here are some questions for you to ask yourself. Number one, is there anything lurking deep within my soul that would hinder me from receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit? We might ask as well, am I willing to give God permission to take anything out of my life that's not in harmony with His will? We might ask, is there something in my life that I have been willing unwilling to surrender. What about you, friend? As you consider those questions, is there something lurking deep within your soul? Is there anything in your life that you're not willing to surrender? Is there some habit in your life? Some habit that you've been clinging to, some habit that you've been holding on to, but you know that that habit is not in harmony with God's will. I was giving a series of lectures and a man that professed to be a strong Christian leader. In fact, he was quite well known in his church. He was an officer in his church. And one day after, oh, I gave a lecture on the deeper spiritual life, about looking within and asking ourselves the question, is there anything in my heart that is lurking there? He said, Pastor, I, I went back to my room and I examined my own heart and there is something lurking there and I have to tell you what it is. He said, Pastor, after my wife and family go to bed, I indulge in certain programs on the television that I know are not in harmony with God's will. And I've become addicted to those programs and they are very shady when it comes to morality. But I don't know how to get out of it. But as I was examining my heart, I am a professed Christian leader. A couple times, my wife has seen me watching those programs. She's been upset. My children have seen it. And Pastor, I know that this is a hindrance to their spiritual life. Pastor, can you help me? We talked about how to overcome those moral issues in our life. I talked about Joseph who fled I talked about Daniel who purposed in his heart to serve God. I talked about the book of James, where in James it says, Submit yourself unto the Lord and resist the devil. And I said to this man, look, this is what I want you to do. You've openly acknowledged your weakness to me. I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult. Openly acknowledge your weakness to your wife. She knows it anyway and give her permission that any time she sees you watching that stuff to walk over to the television and turn it off. Tell her that sometimes you're going to be upset that she does, but you give her that permission. You give her that permission. We knelt and prayed together. With tears streaming down his cheeks, he said to me, Mark, I want to be that godly leader. I see that this is a weakness in my life. I will do this. I, tonight, I'm going to surrender it to Jesus. And I'm going to tell my wife, you have permission to turn that off if I'm watching it. Friend of mine, your soul is at stake. There's a battle for the soul. Do not allow sin that lurks within your heart 
to go unchecked. As you examine yourself, present it to God. And if you need somebody else to help you, if you need a prayer partner, tell them what you're struggling with and ask them to give you support. And I know that as you look to Jesus and look to Jesus and look to Jesus, He will fill you with His Spirit and give you strength to overcome that thing. That was another powerful message from the upper room. Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there's any wicked or hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I'm happy today that Dr. Willie Hux is with us, Associate Secretary of the General Conference Ministerial Association. Willie, how has uh, reflection, self-examination been used by God to bless your life? Well, as I think about this topic, I think of something that I was told when I was a child, and that is those who know you the best have the greatest potential to hurt you the most. And I never really believed that or thought that that was possible until it actually happened uh, to me. Um, I've had a lot of people uh, close to me over the years to hurt me, not, not intentionally. It, it wasn't their design to do so, but things happen over the course of life. And I think of uh, an instance about uh, 10 or so years ago where someone real close to me did something and it, and it hurt me quite a bit in, in the process of that person doing that. And you know, I thought about it and I said, well, you know, things happen. But I noticed over time that we didn't communicate as much anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't pick up the phone and call and, and talk to each other the way that we used to. And one day in my own personal worship, the Lord directed me to the same passage that you just alluded to in Psalm 139. Uh, oh God, search my heart. Um, try me, you know, know my thoughts and see if there's any wicked way in me. And I prayed about that and I asked the Lord, you know, there, there's something wrong. I, I don't have that same joy anymore. I, you know, help me to understand what's going on because Clearly, there's some block between me and, and this person. And the Lord opened doors and helped me to understand that it was about more than the hurt. Um, I was angry. I didn't even like this person anymore. And, and that hatred, and I guess I have to use that word, uh, the hatred that I had in my heart for this person uh, was like a chain that I needed freedom from. I needed emancipation. Mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, as I continued to pray that prayer in Psalm 139, it, it was a frightening prayer because the Lord helped me to understand, well, you have a problem with this person and that person and that person, and the list just kept growing. And, and it was scary, uh, but it was something that I had to do for myself to understand that God was speaking to me and if I wanted true freedom, if I wanted to have the walk with God that, that I knew deep down within that I wanted, there had to be some changes. And it all started with that self-examination. I, I, I can't say that the journey is over yet. I, I'm still struggling in, in some respects, but that self-examination that I started then and that I'm continuing uh, has, has been very beneficial for me. It sounds in a way that... Uh that you were giving God permission to examine you yes. and bringing important insights to your mind. How did that affect you when you responded, even though it seemed a little scary to you at first? It was intimidating for me to be that vulnerable, to, to recognize that I've got issues. <laughs> you know, I've got some problems here. Uh, but you know, in, in the process of going through that self-examination, it, it was liberating. Uh, it, 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 it set me free. To, to really live life the way that Scripture wants me to live it. Uh, Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And that's what I needed, and that has been the greatest benefit for me. And, and it's still something I, I, I want to stress. It's still a journey for me, uh, but it's, this liberating journey has been sweet so far. Thanks for sharing a powerful testimony with us. As we see God lead us in the way everlasting, and I want to pray as we close this time that God would lead you and bless your life. Let's pray together. Holy Father, thank you for this powerful testimony, for allowing each person to be 
led by you and, and find freedom in you. I pray for that for each one of us. And I thank you for your unfailing love in Jesus' name. Amen. Willie, thank you for sharing a powerful testimony with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. I hope that by now you've realized that this 10-day journey through the upper room is no spectator sport. If it's going to benefit you and me, my friend, we need to turn off the TV and slip out of our seats and onto our knees and allow the Holy Spirit to give us the experience that these early disciples had. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in, in you? unless indeed you are disqualified? Now, I grew up in the church, but as a teenager, I came face to face with the realization that if I'm going to be saved in Christ's eternal kingdom, as He wishes and wants me to be, I need to be converted every day. Not just improved or better trained or better educated, converted. And 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you indeed are disqualified. This daily self-examination is absolutely vital to a consistent walk with Jesus. Remember, the weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger you will become in His strength. But how can you know yourself? By spending time in the Word, asking the Lord to reveal your need of Him. He'll do it. In the book, Councils on Stewardship, page 136, Ellen White tells us that Satan is inventing everything that he can possibly devise in order to keep men thoroughly occupied so that they shall have no time to consider the question, how is it with my soul? Today, like no other time in history, we are so constantly connected, so constantly distracted that we need to be very intentional about spending time in self-examination. And so as we close today, I just want to ask you the question, how is it with your soul? Have you spent the time with Jesus today to be assured of your standing with Him? Do you have confidence and assurance in His grace today? There are only two possibilities, and we need to know where we stand. Either Jesus Christ is in us, or we are disqualified. So as we pray and in this program, I want to encourage you to spend some extra time, just you and Jesus, to talk with Him about the condition of your heart. Father in heaven, today we want to pray that you will search our hearts and show us those things that we can make right with you and with others. As we do so, Lord, prepare us to be used by you in your service. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.